background. Um, went to Stanford undergrad, did computer science with a focus in AI. Uh, also got a Bachelor of Arts with a religious studies focus in ethics, and that is the study of right and wrong. Um, they seem very different, but when it comes to like AI, and we'll talk about a little more about some biases and things like that, I mean, what, where's the future of AI going? Um, it actually has a lot more in common with my thing. Um, did some years of consulting, got my MBA, uh, left the United States for a while, went to Samsung, uh, then came back to the States, worked for Beats, um, worked for Apple through the acquisition of Beats, uh, and now I'm at a startup called IM Plus. Um, that's where a lot of the stuff I'm doing, really cool stuff with AI now. Um, that's most of the, the advancements and the excitement has been in the last couple of years. As far as uh, product experience, direct product experience with AI, uh, that includes some fitness uh, health apps, uh, music services, um, for, uh, voice assistance and text-based assistance, um, and also enterprise solutions. So I worked on some consumers, some enterprise stuff, a couple different products. Um, and you know, I know Apple's a big name out here, but I could promote Samsung because I'm a Samsung guy. Uh, <laughs> the, um, and also, you can interrupt me just raise your hand. You can stop and pause uh, and go off tangent. Uh, so quickly, why are we talking about AI now? Um, given that AI has been around for a long time. So like I said, I started with AI back at Stanford a number of years, over a decade ago, I'm not going to go how many specifics, how long ago, but uh, it actually started in the 50s, really. Um, so it kind of had a hype cycle, we're like, yeah, we're going to pass a Turing test, and then kind of like that went down after. It was like, yeah, we kind of got there, but you know, it wasn't that exciting. And now we're coming back in a uh, lot to do with uh, investments in machine learning. So I'm hoping you're going to glance through that, that content. Uh, but mostly in advances in machine learning and really in advances in deep learning. Um, and deep mind, you hear a lot of that from Google and other stuff, like machines teaching itself things, um, like how to run, how to walk, how to draw, um, these kind of things. Those advances is really why we're talking about AI again now and why it's becoming you know, back into the hype cycle going back up here. So there's actually a spectrum to the AI. Um, when most people say AI and just like AI, we're talking about a narrow version of AI. And what narrow means is focused on a very specific type of task that it means. Like, I can only make flights for you. I can only book flight reservations for you. I can only do um, open a coffee pot and pour you tea or a coffee every morning. You know, I can only do one specific task. You know, that's what we call it narrow AI. You can do it very well, but it can only do that one thing. Um, in a general AI sense, this is where we become more like human like. It's a combination of skill sets and domains, um, and it can jump between those freely. Um, but what it lacks is the ability to kind of make its own goals, um, its own have its own wishes and desires. Um, and that's kind of when we get to superhuman AI, or what I like to think is more of a collective AI. There's been a lot of movies about this kind of like superhuman AI, her, Ex Machina, and more recently, and then there's you know, a bunch in the past too, I will buy other things. Uh, but I actually think we're more, right, the, that kind of AI, that like uh, that singularity AI, the AI that kills us all in the movies, uh, it's more of a collective kind of not not a hive mind, but more collective. A lot of pieces working together um, in harmony, um, as opposed to think like at the end of I don't know if you saw the movie, but spoiler alert. Um, you can close your ears for like 30 seconds if you don't want to hear. Um, you know, the, the AI develops lots of uh, relationships, falls in love with lots of different things. Uh, AIs and around the world and like maintain simultaneous relationships with them. So then that's kind of where we're headed more collective. And I can get really philosophical by AI, uh, but we're gonna kind of jump back up to where at the top. It's kind of narrow AI. That's the main focus. That's what everyone's really doing right now. Your Alexa's, uh, your Google Assistant's, series they're all basically more or less narrow AIs um, that are trying to become more general. Again, stop me if there's any questions from that. Does general AI exist? Out there, like in some supercomputer that uh, some government's hiding. <laughs> no, I mean, I think in the academic community, the answer is no. Uh, in the business world, you know, some people also say that yeah, they have AI, but I wouldn't trust them. Uh, the so coming back uh, now, there's some kind of examples of AI. As AI is already you're already using it practically every day. Uh, maybe you recognize them, maybe you don't. Um, there's chatbots. Again, sometimes you don't even know you're talking to a chatbot. Sometimes it's very obvious. Um, customer support is one of those things. Kind of starts out like, hey, how are you doing? Uh, and then it quickly like, oh, I want to do this thing. It's like, sorry, can you repeat that? Now you realize you're talking to a chatbot, not a person. Um, or recommendation engines, you know, Netflix, Amazon, 
they've been doing this for years and years and years. Um, predictive services, you know, every time you go in, uh, your is gonna take X amount of time, that's an AI, it's calculating things, and it's making a prediction um, about what the future is, and we're making a decision about where it should go. Um, spam, what is good mail versus bad email? Those are decisions made by you know, algorithms, that's AI. Uh, Self-driving cars, your phone, uh, when your phone, when your Fitbit knows you're walking or running, that's a machine learning algorithm that we train and model and it makes a decision, uh, and that's AI. I kind of missed this point earlier, sorry. <laughs> Uh, when I talk about AI, when I'm talking the intelligence part, it's the making the decision part. Um, if there's no decision to be made, then it's not really AI, it's just kind of like an automated process. Um, but once it makes a decision, um, when there's a branch in the, in the flows, and it has a side going left or right, that's AI. Now, it's, and now there's intelligence, there's a decision being made. Um, sorry for saying that. The uh, kind of more advanced stuff you'll see in your series, your Alexas, these are controlled assistants. It's a term that I made up. Um, but I like the <laughs> top column this. And what I mean by control is controlled assistance is something that you give commands to. Do this, okay, I can do this. Do A, do B, do C, oh, I can't do C. Uh, and then it's kind of like that. That's your relationship with that kind of system. And then you have the uncontrolled agents. Um, and I call them agents because they act on their own, and that's another term for things that act on their own. And this is things you see in games, you know, you're, you have a team of five, you know, that you're running around shooting, uh, fighting the aliens, and like the other four guys are kind of doing their own thing, you know, figure out which guns to get, you know, where to go, who to shoot at, you know, they kind of do their own thing. You don't control them, you don't tell them where to go um, and how to act, but they have rules that they follow and the understanding of the world. Um, yeah. The um, last piece, not so much different from the above, but uh, there are different lot of use cases that happen for enterprise and government um, that are. Uh, are more behind the scenes, such as uh, security, um, facial recognition for uh, identifying people, bad guys and alerting authorities, uh, fraud detection, um, making financial decisions. So these kind of behind the scenes things that uh, you don't see, but your life is being impacted every day by AI. Um, this woman, could you explain how Uber is a uncontrollable agent? So I believe Uber is in there because um, it makes it on the, the like if you use Uber Pool and the siding of like, oh, these three people are going in the same direction, kind of, um, so I should put them together in this order. Um, you don't have control over that. And also, Uber doesn't have control over that. They're not telling you know, for every ride request that comes in, hey, do this and do that. Um, it's, they create this this AI that you know looks at the certain set of circumstances and rules and what I'm saying with the world and says, I'm going to make this decision and people are going to have to live with it. And that's kind of what I mean by uncontrolled data. You can't tell it, don't put me with this person. <laughs> well, you kind of clarified that before. I think a different way to look at that, correct me if I'm wrong, is when you say controlled assistant, that means controlled by the user, controlled by the person interfacing or acting with it. The uncontrolled agent is somebody else has set the bounds of the control, not you, the you know, person interacting with it. Because even in the Uber or the game space, someone has set an algorithm or a set of parameters that aren't going to be gone outside of. There's a, someone else in Uber in this case is setting up who decides what order they go in based on their efficiency and their revenue model. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, I'll elaborate a little bit more. Kind of, okay. I think you can also set bounds, but the, the uh, and as we get to more intelligent AI systems, this is becoming going to become more important, like how do we deal with the, the ethics of this, uh, of this, where I gave it rules, but I didn't know it was going to go through the same. You know, I give you an example of a self-driving car. There, uh, the, crap, the one that crashed in Vegas an hour after it started, um, where it kind of had a lot of understanding of how to drive on the road, but it didn't know how to deal with drivers that have bad behavior. So it stopped, and this truck was backing up, and it's honked. It's like all I want to do is honk. You know, um, I know I need to let people know that there's something bad happening, but I don't know. I don't know what else to do. Uh, and in a real world, like a person would back up. <laughs> Or try to move out of the way, <laughs> or yell, you know, do something else. Um, so this uncontrolled agent, like, you kind of said, here's go, do out, go out there, do stuff. Um, but I don't know everything that it might do, and how it might react to every situation. Whereas control is a very specific, do X, and then you're going to do X, but you're not going to do anything else. Um, you're going to drive straight, but you're not going to decide to change lanes because you don't have any freedom to make decisions in that kind of way. You're going to do what I tell you. But it knows to like stay in the lane, and that's AI too. It's kind of like a little tricky, but I hope that makes sense. Uh, yeah, we'll come more at least. Uh, we're going to have a less last discussion about AI and how we use it. Um, but um, this being product school, I am a product manager for a number of years now doing AI. 
Uh, I do have a very technical background. Not everyone has to be very technical. But one of the things I think is beneficial for anyone who wants to work with AI in products is to have some basic understanding of how it works um, at a more, uh, more granular level in terms of the components involved and why they're necessary. Um, because then you can start to make decisions about um, why your system can compete against a Google uh, assistant or a Siri and things like that. Um, so it's kind of like some main things. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's not like the main stuff. Uh, so ASR here is speech recognition. Uh, takes the words that are coming out of our mouth in terms of the text, uh, and hopefully with a lot of accuracy. Um, and we've gotten pretty good in that. It's basically a solved problem now. Um, TTS, um, that's the text-to-speech. Um, it takes the words on paper, turns them into voice vocal sounds. Um, NLP and NLU kind of used interchangeably, but there's slight like differences there. Uh, natural language processing, that's NLP. Um, Kind of includes more grammar and understanding. Like there's a verb here, there's a you know, subject here, and there's a um, there's a word here that's like maybe similar to this other word, um, like a car and automobile. But the NLU understanding, um, natural language understanding, may add other things to that. Uh, that um, when I say this is good, that's a positive thing. Or uh, like that means do these other actions, and it adds uh, intent to what the user says. <coughs> not just understanding of the words, not just the processing of the words, but adds meaning to those words. Um, it's something that we do all the time as humans. We don't think a lot about it, and that's, yeah, that's how you get misunderstandings. About, you know, I understood it one way, you understood it a different way, and machines are going to AI is going to have that same problem. Um, we might have to work through those problems. Um, once I understand it, then there's kind of some action I have to do, right? You know, uh, buy tickets to this movie at 9 p.m. Okay, well. I understood that there was a movie, and I could get an action, the action's buy. Now, how do I buy stuff? You know, that all has to be programmed in logic. Um, Alexa uses a concept called skills. Um, so all the skills that are you put in Alexa, it's the logic to do all these actions. Um, you know, knowledge bases that support that kind of information. Except that one movie, what's the new movie coming up? Last Jedi. Uh, if I mean takes The Last Jedi, and you have to be able to know what Last Jedi is. Somewhere in there, the database someone that says Last Jedi is a movie. Um, next is kind of memory, uh, well, short term, long term. Uh, <laughs> my name is just on, you know, so I nice to be stored somewhere, um, which is a little different from context, which is maybe like what's happening around me right now, which may not need to be stored, but just be understood. Um, I want to go home. The context is I'm starting from here. Uh, but I don't have to say that I'm here. To, you know, I can pull that information in. It's not information that's a story where I can go find it and get it, but it has context. <laughs> so that's kind of like some high, like a quick one through of some uh, common components used in AI. Um, and then really the secret sauce of there, why different AIs are different or maybe have different goals is they kind of put these together differently. Um, there's a lot of architecture decisions you have to make around this and what happens first and what happens afterwards and where do you get your data sources from and someone else gets their data sources. So understanding these things um, can help you think about how your product can be different. And I'll kind of maybe ASR or TTS, text to speech. Um, it's also a solved problem. You know, it's very easy for machines to read the words on the table, but to make them sound more human, that's a much hard, difficult problem. Or how much money do you want to invest in a person actually reading every single word in every single language um, in every accent of that language? You know, so there's like some, some boundaries there, but maybe you can make difference in your product because no one's doing it in Russian or somewhere else, you know, some other language or some other dialect um, as well. And people gravitate to your product because it has a better PTS, not because you, like, you think different than Google or Siri or et cetera, or Alexa. Question? Yeah. I think uh, NLP is very passionate, but I know there are like technical libraries in the Python of R for NLP. Are there any, are you aware of any libraries for NIU in either Python or R or any other technical libraries out there? Um, and I put them together because depending on how you structure this and the processing of it, a lot of people do kind of lump them together. Um, so some of the libraries are, 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 are similar uh, or use use of both uh, places. I would say for how my company does it, um, there aren't any libraries, we built everything from scratch. Um, and we don't use any actually external services. However, that being said, there are, well, actually, 
they're getting bought up. A lot of the startups <laughs> that are creating these, uh, you know, like services that you can use to, so you don't have to build it yourself are getting bought by you know, Apple and Google and uh, other startups, you know, AI startups. Facebook's probably going to buy one soon. Salesforce.com, they're a new buying company. So, you know, a lot of them are getting bought up right now. So, so if you wanted to build like a sentiment analysis uh, system, would you go with NLP or NLP? Well, I both. Um, so like NLP, it will tell me pull out what words are good, or what the words I should pull out where. Um, I feel, okay, this word, whatever is next coming after I feel is an important word, pull that out, that's NLP. Uh, and then once I get that word, how do I know if it's good, bad, or neutral, or you know, happy, sad, you know, that's some understanding of happy, happy on that. So I would say that's why I put them together, it's kind of, they're, they're not too far apart from each other. So, um, we're assuming here that there's a, well, for the, to make the simple, that there's one input that drives an action or something like that. There's some scheme and stuff that you know, you know, collect this many of these things and then from this we generate that understanding and then we can come up with the actions or Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here, let's move to the next slide. Maybe so, context, I love the words. Context is one of those things, the last few seconds you there. So while, when this input comes in, so we'll, I'll say like right now, like the user said this, but at the same time, we know what time of day it is, we know the location, we know what's happening in the world, um, some other stuff that I won't get into that's part of the recipe sauce. Um, maybe we pull all those things together with the, what the user actually said um, to know this way, you know, help, it, it help us um, classify. And so I'll work through a little bit of kind of what I mean by kind of dubbing to your point, like NLU you know, stuff. So training, there are a lot of libraries for training. Um, and you can, um, TensorFlow and that kind of stuff you can use to help build, get your models going, help train them. Um, and what you're gonna do is classify, buy tickets for blah, blah, blah. That's an intent for movies, or movies buying movie tickets, or whatever you wanna classify that intent into. Uh, then you need to extract things out of that intent once you've classified it. Or you can do it other things, kind of up to you. Uh, you need to extract information which movie, what time, how many people. Um, and then that's why you get questions like that when you ask Alexa or any other system like, oh, do this thing. And this is missing information, this extraction piece, we're gonna ask you a follow-up question. Yeah, what time, how many people, what people said, et cetera. Um, and then it takes all that piece, all those pieces of information that is extracted and after it's classified, I know what action I want these ones to do, I have all the relevant information. Um, I, now I have some understanding. Um, maybe I acknowledge I know what this, what this, what kind of movie this is, um, and now I can act. So the actual buying of it maybe goes to MovieTickets.com or whatever services or APIs um, that helps help them to act. Um, I think these pieces are areas of improvement. So say um, buy movie tickets for nine people is very simpler to um, buy. Buy concert tickets for two people, um, and so the on the action side is like, oh, I, I got tickets and I know how many people, um, and this concert name sounds a lot like this movie, so I'm gonna go buy a movie ticket. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want a movie, I want a concert. Then that's a correction, um, and a lot of systems don't do this at all. Um, you have to kind of restart it over, or you just can't do that. That you can't follow that flow because it's gonna make the same mistake over and over again. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done here in correction. Um, and as well as kind of relearn now that I've corrected you, how many times do I have to correct you before you learn? Um, and this is what keeps us from really getting towards the general AI. This is these two things. Um, it's very easy to go narrow um, and get to this part. Um, but it's very hard to do these other two pieces. And that's where the general can switch between domains and like learn from this past mistakes so that it doesn't make the same mistakes. This is where we start getting, getting this right, moves us closer towards the general AI. And then once you have that, this is closer to the super AI, you know, that's in the movies. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about your secret sauce and stuff like that. What's the direction of this development? Is, is there eventually someone or something or some group that can allow these kind of tools to allow us, maybe it's open source, maybe it's not, to allow us to kind of build our own applications or it's just kind of like, we're all gonna buy all these different companies and just lock it away. No, no, no. Um, the buying of the companies is so um, Google doesn't have to invest, or Facebook, or anyone either. Um, Apple doesn't have to invest as much in the research that someone else has already done. 
what they want is to make this really accessible and available so that everyone's using Google's version of how all of this works. Um, and they want you to not have to worry about for your app, I don't know, so I'm looking at paintings in the background here, um, that so, uh, an AI that helps people find the right painting um, and put it in their home. And you don't, you don't have to worry about like, oh, do I need to build a classification model and then train that over and over again on pictures of, uh, of art. Um, but like, no, Google, we'll see here, we already have this for you. And then you can like take that module and then put it in your own app. You can think about other problems to solve. So I think that's where we're going. The issue will become, and then going back to some more philosophical piece, sorry for you guys, I'm not going to turn this way. I just like to tell that a little bit, so I apologize. Um, is then, do we want to have all this information within a few select companies? Or was it better for it to be more broadly sorted out? Um, it's kind of the same thing you see right here. You, or should you have an email account with Google and you're also in your photos or with Apple, you know, um, et cetera? Should you do everything with one company or should you have other pieces so you can spread the knowledge around? Because then it becomes like who's controlling what? Um, and especially as we get AI and get smart and starts making more decisions for us, right? Are you controlling the AI or is AI controlling you? Is the AI controlling you? Is it by a corporation? Um, is it the government? Is it something else? Uh, on the more philosophical side, you know, other problems we can solve later, not in the session, but something to think about. Um, and, but right now, they're kind of, they want you to use their platform, so I'm trying to. Well, and, uh, because everybody has a platform, not everyone, but they're like main layers, and they have a platform. And, um, if, let's say, an example, I was a digital assistant for the services for an app, and I have to develop it for every single uh, platform user, like there will be one instance for Alexa, one because there were something that you can just grab something once and then every platform understands. Yeah, um, good question. And that's kind of the part of the race, too. Get, make your platform so big that it becomes a new Windows or Mac or uh, Android, iOS. And so it's a lot. Right now, we don't have that. Um, mostly because, I mean, Apple just recently opened up their platform. Uh, their AI. So you can add. Uh, I, as an app developer, can use Siri to help you know bring a full SH to my uh, app. So that's only this one recently happened, you know, in the last year or so. So there's not a whole lot. Of Alexa, we could say has the lead on this, but you know most of the skills aren't used. Um, so then, is really the big platform is a kind of like a platform that some people use sometimes. But in short, yes, you can develop across the board unless you build your own that you use is agnostic. But then you have a, a distribution problem. We should come back to that in another slide. Um, we're talking about a couple of you know big companies. So AI is not just going to be, I think, only Google, Amazon, IBM, Apple, these kind of companies. Um, they're struggling with a lot of things, and they're trying to. If you think about how, if you need to um, set up, host a website service, or would you build you know a bunch of machines yourself, or would you go to Amazon? Web services. You probably go to Amazon Web Services. They got all the infrastructure. You know, it's easy, cheap to buy. That's where these companies are kind of headed because um, you need a lot of data to power deep learning. And deep learning isn't. Um, it doesn't apply. It, uh, a lot of algorithms or some things that I learn, machine learning or basic machine learning algorithm. Once you give it enough data, it kind of like stabilizes. Like a cat's a cat's a cat. But what a, a deep learning kind of, it doesn't have the same plateau because it has the ability to kind of learn on itself and make some, some guiding decisions about where it what wants to take a, a thing. So maybe it can draw a new type of cat that's never existed before. So that's the advantage of deep learning. It doesn't have the same kind of plateau, but to do that, you need so much data and understanding about what a cat is and what's not a cat. Uh, and so that all care, gathering all that data and cleaning it and making it accurate and things like that takes a lot of time and effort. That's what those companies are focused on. Um, Again, machine learning, this processing time, the reason why I stopped doing it over a de decade ago um, is because it took me a, a day, literally 24 hours, to process you know, simple changes and to see if it, my algorithm went from like 92% accurate to 92.5% accurate. Um, and I was like, this is too slow to <laughs> So then I was like, <laughs> and I got an MBA and I got into business. Uh, and the, you know, but now we're doing this much faster, but it still takes a lot of processing power. These machines, these GPUs that they want. Uh, are very expensive. Um, so another thing, kind of the narrow AI versus general AI. Um, they're really focused on how we make this more general. 
you know, they have all this data, they have all these resources, have a lot of computing power. How can we make these things more general? Because right now they're still kind of in this narrow place. And even in my view, self-driving cars are pretty narrow. They're somewhat general, but you can't take a, all the AI in a self-driving car and then tell it to, okay, now uh, pick stocks. It doesn't work that way. I uh, well, currently doesn't work that way, but that's where we want to try to get to. That's what I mean by general. This AI now can like, sure, I know how to drive a car, now I can learn how to pick stocks, and I can learn how to do this, I can learn how to uh, walk a dog. Um, but that's something human can do pretty easily, but AI can. Uh, large companies, they kind of get stuck in their platform, so this is a good, if you're working at a smaller company, you find ways to put holes in that platform and you know, get into that niche, and that's how it's going I want to talk about this in the next slide too, but uh, also, um, there's biases in everything. People write algorithms. People tell the machine what's right. Um, and those people have different cultural backgrounds, and, you know, different value systems, and they will guide those algorithms on machine learning, that AI, to think like it, like me. Um, and even if I try not to say, don't think like me, all I'm doing is teaching it the things that I don't think like, which is different, there's another bias of that I have, right? Because you think differently than I do. Uh, what about unsupervised systems? Um, they're still biased because the, 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 the data is not biased, but the way that it processes the data is biased. How? How is it? It's not supervised. Just how? If you can architect, how you architect the, the, the processing, right? I mean, just what does learning mean, right? I have to then, if you, if you go back here, there's a lot of things. So. I, I mean, I don't want to go on a side jump. Are you going to cover the unsupervised stuff later? I, 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 I started with it earlier. I didn't really go deep. No, I'm not going to go any further. Yeah. further. And we can follow up after, too, but I quickly try it. Um, unsupervised, just, this means like the data isn't, 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 isn't trained, you know, and the you have to kind of machine cluster of the information and so on. Um, but it's, in, in order for that to be useful, it has to do certain actions, all these kind of things. It has to classify, I think it's this cluster, I think it's this cluster. Um, and then it has to understand what's in that cluster. Um, and that that piece, all that work is biased. Because that's someone telling you, like, hey, do these things, or use every third word. Why, why not every fourth word? Why not use the first two and then skip three and then come back, you know? There's a lot, that is a bias. So that's why they, they still get biased, human bias. Quickly, uh, just, yeah, I think I talked more than I thought I was going to talk. Uh, smaller companies can compete in the space, I kind of already mentioned this. Um, use someone else's platforms for solve problems. I mean, speech recognition is pretty good nowadays. I wouldn't you know, encourage you all to go above on speech recognition unless there is some effective competitive advantage, you know, somehow. Uh, because, like, I was working on a project and we needed to do the UK. You know how many English accents are in the UK? <laughs> you know, so we got to make sure that our speech recognition was better than it was in the market for all the different types of accents in the UK. Um, so that was the reason why we wanted to train especially. But you may not have that use case, so you may not need to do that. You might invest those resources. Um, again, try to find some of these unsolved problems, distraction, and knowledge resolution. Uh, like I said, it's really easy to take distinct things. I want to go to this movie at 9 p.m. I got a movie, I got a time, I got a number of people, I got some things. But what if I said I want to go to movie A, B, C, and D? Uh, and I want to go through to them on any day this week. Or I want to go to these days, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Machines are really bad at understanding things like that. Because you know, I got multiple instances of the same type of uh, object or concept, uh, concept like movie. So how do I know when the first movie ends and when the second movie ends and the third movie ends? They're kind of all movies together. They're machines don't work that intelligent. They kind of like it's like I kind of group one thing together, but once I get them all together, it's it's confusing. Like a grocery list. Oh, buy apples, bananas, and peaches. Um, I know you can say that to any system. You just want to know how to separate. I mean, there's some tricks you can do, but it's not that's not true machine learning. It's not true AI. That's rules and devices. Find specific words and then pull them out. But in a general sense, to make it really AI, uh, we don't do it well. So these are examples of like unsolved problems that if you go out and do well, you'll probably get bought by a bunch of your company. They'll say, okay, great, thanks for solving that problem, I'll add it to our system. Um, again, finding domains that everyone's working in, like I don't think anyone's working on an AI to again pick out art to put in people's homes. You know, that could be a great domain. It could not be. I mean art can be very expensive, most people have money. So <laughs> something to think about. Um, and then making you experience superior UX, you know, how you talk to it, how you would voice you hear back. Um, how, what the quality of the voice, uh, things like that, you know, bites, <laughs> you know, uh, 
and show up, you know, things. So there's been lots of ways you can make the experience around the AI very superior to what else is in the market. Now this is a way that smaller companies can compete. Um, and then kind of, and it's getting close to the end of uh, my story over here. Uh, some things that I think are worth going after is handling a mix of like commands and kind of unstructured dialogue, very conversational. Uh, so if I tell you, um, hey, I'm going to turn on the lights, cool, oh, got that command. Um, but I don't know. I think it's. I think I like it better, you know, if when the sun doesn't set, you know, too early, and it says something like that. Well, what does that mean to the machine? It doesn't know what this is, but you see. You know, now machine has to take that and process that information and goes figure out what to do with it. And then you go back to, then maybe the research like, oh, well, should I always turn the lights when the sun sets early? You know, they can have that kind of dialogue with you. But right now, we don't really do that as well. Um, so these are like things that like, go between like, I give you a command, understand commands, doing command wall, and then also handling this free flowing speech and then be able to know when to speak up and when not to speak. Um, understanding non non lingual fuels, I don't know if that's a word or not. Uh, right now, it's all built on text. You know, I say something, it's converted to text. The machine understands text. Uh, I, and it, it steps back and then it speaks text back to me. Uh, but it doesn't understand. Well, we are training face, you know, hand gestures. You know, if I start doing this, what is that good or bad? I don't, you know, machines don't know. In fact, you probably don't know. It's all like, what? It's that good. <laughs> um, so, but like, as we understand those things, you know, I, I know what as a human would. That will broaden the perspective, uh, what AI can do and what it can understand, and also how it can communicate back to us. You know, maybe it doesn't need to be verbal all the time; just blinking its eyes could be something that's meaningful. Um, also, the need to be pro. Oh, sorry, the context. Um, this is tricky. We have short-term and long-term memories. Um, is that good or bad? Should machines mimic us? Should they not? Should they remember everything? I'll solve problem. Uh, but we need really some understanding of like what's important. How many people have used Gmail? And gotten the, how many people have every email marked as important? I don't know if you know the important feature of Gmail. You probably don't because it's everything's important. Uh, so, so machines don't understand what's important, what's not important, and it's so contextual, so like so personal. Uh, so this is another area to like work in. Um, another one is being proactive. Again, basically all systems today, you have to think of something to say. And that's why it's command driven. That's why a lot of them, like, and that's why Google Assistant doesn't have a name. It's called Google Assistant for a reason. It's not trying to be your friend or have a relationship or dialogue with you. It wants to, what are you going to do? Um, and so you give, think of things to tell it to do. Um, it's very kind of boring interaction. You know, I would love for it to like tell me stuff. You know, hey, it's, it's kind of late. You know, do you need a bedtime story? Help them sleep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, no, I'm good tonight. Yeah, stuff like that. The uh, last piece is uh, kind of like developing a relationship with users. This is big, but it really kind of gets down to one, one of my biggest pet peeves. Um, you want to use an AI system, it's like, okay, great. Now give me access to all your contacts and your emails, and give me a bank account uh, or a credit card number, um, and all this information so I can do everything for you. It's like, well, I just met you. Come on. <laughs> uh, how about we just start with like something simple, like how's the weather? You know? <laughs> we can work to like my contacts. Oh, yeah, call my mom, let her know that like uh, she should a jacket, you know. Like, okay, we can work up to that kind of stuff, and that's how you move with people too. Um, and I think this is going to be something that uh, changes over time, especially as AI gets smarter and people get more skeptical of it. Um, you see a lot more barriers and things. Like so that was none of my own speed. Yes, this is where we're here. Thanks. I'll go do these things and then let me know so we can like work together. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, do you think there's going to be a, a wave of, of uh, skepticism before uh, acceptance when it comes to humans and their relationship between humans and AI? Um, yes. The, and then you think about it also in every movie, and it makes sense, right? New things are scary, fear them, um, and they will try to resist. Um, there will be some groups that like hate AI. Uh, I mean, like, AI is terrible, I want nothing to do with it. Um, and I'm going to go live in a world that's pre AI. Um, and there is examples of that today. Amish um, like, or like there's kind of like I said, draw a line in the sand, nothing after this time. Um, and I think we'll see some, some things like that um, develop um, as an extreme. Um, 
But I think the most pieces, like, I don't understand why it does. And you're like a person who thinks it. I'm inviting a new person into my, my house that has a lot of decision making authority. Should I open this door for this, the stranger that opened that came by? Because uh, they're delivered. Or they're a pizza guy. Or, you know, just someone who knocked on the door wearing a hat that said pizza on it. You know, and I have to think, do I really trust this AI to make those kind of decisions? Um, until we start seeing that, you know, we will this will be skepticism at first, and then after a while, of, you know, some trial and error, and then we'll kind of like figure it out. Um, some bad things might happen, and then we'll make some rules, and we'll counteract it, and then more people will accept it, and then we'll kind of. How does time to control the decision making process work? Because it's not cognizant computing. Cognizant computing. Um, I'm actually not. Um, that we're not, I don't know that topic as well, so I'm sorry. Yeah, it's just, um, as is like from a product management point, like you have an idea, you think AI is going to be a good fit for it. Like, what are the steps to trying to figure that out? Because, like, great question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I know this. Yeah, this is a product meeting, so we're going to like definitely talk a little bit about product here. Um, but I think it's also important to understand. What took me so long to get to this point is, what is AI? What's the differences? We'll talk about AI. Um, what are the levels of AI? And also, what are kind of the components that go into like making an AI system work? Um, which I will help make. There are a lot of you know product managers that work in AI. They don't really understand how it works, and they make very simple, basic AIs. That there's nothing wrong with that. But again, you're going to be in a sea of other AIs. So how do you stand out? You stand out by understanding the all the things we talked about earlier. Um, and then apply some kind of you know, methodology to that. Um, so you gotta find a problem to solve. Um, like, so I just came up with one now with like a garden in, in my apartment. Um, then use cases and user stories, very traditional product management you know, cycles here. Pain point, solving the pain point, you know, with stories and diagrams. Um, and then when you look at those user stories, the steps that it takes, well, you know, first I gotta define a place that sells art. I gotta figure out what goes well with my building. All these kind of things, steps. Well, where can I, what are the decisions I have to make? And those decisions, and again, decisions is what makes intelligence, and intelligence is how you get AI. Um, all those decision points then can be a place to use AI. Um, and then once you have those decision points, you need to understand, like, oh, how complicated is the decision? Is it a simple rule? Um, like, red light means stop, green light means go. You know, very simple rule based, you know, you can do something very simple. You don't need a complicated, well, is it this shade of green or that shade of green? This, you know, you don't need to do all that. You kind of like kind of can work in this uh, very simple place, or do you need something more complex? Um, so, once you kind of understand that, you know, get a team, technical team, develop a happy path. So, you start with a happy path. I don't call it MVP, I call it a happy path. Um, um, what is the most optimal case that you can think of? Do that first, you kind of have your. Uh, kind of. <laughs> uh, from the happy path, you'll need you'll have a couple things you need to think about. Um, and I have the decision points that I want to add automate with AI. Um, I know what flow I want to go through. What data do I need to support this? Um, same thing data input inputs that you would use as a human. Like again, like uh, my wall is this color, so I should probably think of colors in this range. You know, that's input. Uh, and then once you have all that data that you think would be good inputs. Um, you need to train, going back to the more like train, classify, extract, and things. You need to train a model to then use all those inputs to give a recommendation uh, or make a decision. Um, this train, you test that. Uh, do I like those decisions or I don't like those decisions? Sometimes it's really clear. Uh, like, is this picture a cat? You know, it's kind of like, kind of know if that's, if that's good or not. Because uh, we know this is a cat. But something more vague, like, are these colors good with these colors? Maybe, maybe not, you know, you kind of like an eye of the beholder. So that kind of like test and validity, maybe you need to go back to your user base and say like, hey users, do you like what, you know, what my AI is giving you? Or no, you know, so they can go tweak the models. So sometimes it's really clear, sometimes it's not very clear. Um, and again, so refine your use cases, um, also handling error conditions and not happy path flows, you know, use context. Also, they're not going to be able to make everybody happy all the time. I, like, I heavily on the 80 20 of this. Um, you know, no AI is going to be perfect, like no human is perfect, because one AI has human biases, so no human is perfect, so AI can be perfect, um, until AI starts writing itself. Um, but then that AI has human biases in it, so I don't know what that leads to. Uh, again, more for philosophy. Um, 
update your application logic. These are like you know Alexa skills. This is the do I only buy movie tickets from one you know using one API or do you use three APIs and find the best deal for the user. Different things you can do like that to uh, help aid the AI's action. Um, and after you do all this, you collect, collect a bunch of samples and uh, you see how it's being used. You then train your models and you again test, refine, train. That's kind of like repeats. So, but where in this list, because if you're like retraining and seeing what the result is, where would that some sort of product be released, or is that still just all internal? So, I mean, there's a definitely like a a standard product, man. You know, uh, come up with a problem on design, you know, build, test, launch, support, you know, type of flow. Um, so, I just consider that standard and. You know, I want to make this meaning more about like the AI part of it. Like, how would I put AI in that design process? How would I put AI in that build process? I forgot that build. <laughs> build how would I put AI in the test process and things like that. Uh, I have some. I also on this slide have some questions that may be useful to think about. But if you have any other, I mean, we can still stay here. But the next slide has questions. Like, if I was doing this, what questions would I ask myself? Um, are you allowed to talk about any real world examples of like the problem you solved and then how you applied it? Well, I mean, this, this every problem. Um, so I can go back a few years uh, when uh, does anyone use Samsung phones? Anyone use the S Health app? Um, on the S Health app, there's uh, it uh, has the ability in your phone or your pocket use the sensors to determine from sitting, standing, walking, doing, going here or there, um, and then that's the basic level. And then after I know what those activities. And make some other predictions about if you do an extra of this, you may burn extra block calories or you might meet X fitness goals. Um, so that problem starts with how do how do the sensors know if I'm sitting or standing? And because the phone's here, or it's here, or it's in the hand, so there's a bunch of different data points that like, well, first I have a problem. I need to know the phone needs to know what the user's doing. What are the examples of that? Of sitting, standing, walking, blah, blah, blah. Um, what decision points is it? Like after I get these pieces of data, then I say, yep, they're sitting. If it's at this angle, if it's at this angle, if it's at this angle, for this amount of time, that's sitting, or that's walking, or that third of us. So um, we collect a bunch of data points, we like hold the phones in different places, pockets, you know, get all those data points together, make a model around the data. Do I have here? No, I didn't answer that. Um, I have some long list of like how to then like model, make a model. Um, but it gets more technical, and it's, I don't want to get this high level. Um, yeah, so then same thing. Then we tested it. So I'm like, yeah, it was so so on the sitting, you know, pretty good on the walking and running. So let's go back and tweak the sitting pieces. You know, so then we kind of go through that process again. And once we do all that, then now we can then take what about the next level of problems? Yeah, we're really good at sitting and walking if you're in a bus or in a car, um, things like that. Now, what can we do with those pieces of information to make more predictions, more decisions about people? You know, should they do, once they get at this time, 6 p.m., we should make a prediction, should they walk for 30 more minutes? Should they run? Should they do something else? So you can start using those, then you create a new problem, new use case, and just already new decision points, new data to collect, new, so. You can have like a use case, and I think there was something about this recently on the Apple Watch, where somebody was having like a stroke, and the Apple Watch sent out an emergency signal to somebody, to friend or family member, so you can program all that stuff in, and have different scenarios to, Notify you in mass or notify you. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't even know I did that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's exactly. The AI is trained to like recognize stroke patterns. Yeah, and then make decisions off of that. How how do you decide? It's pretty early on that you bring other disciplines in so that you can kind of like maybe uh, work through some of those biases or like maybe there's some extra. Like, here's an exercise for the old just like when I do this thing, it expends as much out or something, something along those lines. But at what point do you bring those kind of people? Do you have like a brain trust or something like that? Just going to go, these guys don't want to win. Yeah, and a great example is that is um, um, heartbeat recognition, you know, the sensor. Um, a lot of those early models were just with white people. Um, so they didn't work with people with dark skin very well. Um, so this is where, yeah, if someone who's um, either a marketing person or a socialist, someone that's like, uh, let me, if you're gonna do this product, what's your demographic? Someone who knows to ask the right questions, 
oh yeah, we only tested on this. It's like, no, yeah, that's not gonna work. Maybe we should get some more people and then test on it. So I think it's just, yeah, definitely. Um, I think those are good times, especially at the, um, determine like what input and uh, what inputs you need and also what decisions should be made. You know, maybe in some cultures, they don't want the alert to go to, if I'm having stroke, to go to um, a family member, they rather go straight to a doctor or hospital. And that's how their system is set up. Um, in the universal healthcare system, so I don't know. But then you, there's a couple places where at those points, I think we do ask, uh, we also do for a linguist, you know, for a specialist of speech. Um, we bring in linguists, we bring in uh, sociology people, um, a lot of marketing people, market research, demographics, and studies. Yeah, and again, high level. Uh, your day to day could be very different. Every company could have different, you know, ways of going about it. Apple and Samsung were very different about how they went about doing these kind of problems. So, uh, we just have a high level. Uh, cool. I left this slide for last because I wanted to have. I wasn't sure if you guys would ask questions. So if I went through everything and you asked me questions, this would answer questions that I thought might jog your questions. Um, so, again. Do I need AI? That's not my preferred. Or, sorry. Do I need AI? Yes, no. Maybe. Do I want it to have natural language capabilities? Is it something that needs to be spoken to, or something that happens like again with the health thing? I don't need to ask it to figure out if I'm running or walking. It does it. I, it's something we built into the health application. When you say that, do you have like a cost benefit analysis of what's the decision point to implement? Because you've got a great line there, number two, that says, "What level of AI do I need?" Um, and based on your definitions up front, that makes sense. And on the last one, it was step three or something. Um, you went three, through your decision points to then figure out what to do. Where Where is the cost side of that equation? Because how much time do you have in your program schedule? How much resource dollars do you have to spend to implement would then dictate a lot of the things that would flow down from there? Um, absolutely. I mean, again, like with every product decision, there's a triangle of like time, cost, and quality or something. And speed. Resource. Speed. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure that there's, you know, square version, and like other versions, but uh, this, uh, yeah. Um, how much time do you have available? How much money do you have available? Often say, anything there's questions about, are there libraries available? Right. Part of that's sort of my, and do I have to write my own? <laughs> that's a lot of work. Do I have to study myself? You know, can I find the data scientists? Uh, if I can't find them, they're all hired already. Uh, and there's no one graduating in the next two years, you know, so then you know, kind of, Thoughts and process. Can I borrow other consulting companies that do this already? Um, so, for yeah, I'll give you uh, time is one of those things. But then I think at the end of the day, as a product manager, I've asked myself what's right for the customer, what's right for this solution and product. So maybe if I don't have, if I can't do it, if I only have a six month window, can I make the product that should be made in six months? And if I can't, maybe I should think about doing something else in the meantime. Um, then you can see the questions there. Well, I don't know if everyone can see them, but hopefully you can see them. Yeah, but, uh, well, let's wait. <laughs> so, in terms of product management AI, um, it sounds like a lot of it is database, logic based, kind of uh, detail oriented understanding. Is it also a lot of like, technical knowledge that you need? I know you said you don't need a lot, like these are things to know, know about them, but in reality, actually being a product manager, is it more beneficial if you do have that technical knowledge, or can you actually still contribute and be valuable without that? Um, it, the transfer depends, and the, it depends because it depends on the company you're in. Uh, some company product management is a marketing function. Um, it doesn't like isn't deep with the engineering side. Some is very deep with the engineering side. Uh, Google's a prime example of that. You have that a lot of technology in product management. Um, and other companies are in the middle. Um, and I would say, yeah, the more you understand about not how to do it yourself, um, but why it's important that these decisions exist. So again. What does speech recognition do? Oh, it does this. Why is that important to the system? It's important because if we don't understand speech, nothing else works. Uh, okay, we have now. I know my users are in places where they have where speech recognition is historically bad. So now we have a decision. I have a decision as a product manager of like where I want to take this. Um, so again, if you don't know to ask that question about oh speech recognition, 
and we go out and you're like, okay, we'll be tested only in America, and then now we go out to this other place that where it's typically historically bad, it's gonna fail. So understanding those components helps you to make decisions early on that you don't learn post release. With the, the what level of AI do I need? Like one of the, the problems I've had with my company, we, we built a lot of rules based systems over the years and we're comfortable with that. And we're like, can it get better? And I think there's somewhat of a fear is that we'll build this whole structure and do all this deep learning and it will just turn out that it can't quite do the tasks or whatever. I, I don't personally think that, but like how do you I mean, is there a risk that you do all this research and you think you build your models and you train it and it's just giving you, well, we, we do um, fitness, we do like workout, we take custom workout programs for like cardio and stuff. And like, is there a risk that like you go through this whole process and just comes out that like, it's no better than a rule system at best and at worst is just shooting out the junk that we hurt people? Um. Then you come back to, again, what decisions are, is the AI making? Um, my hunch again will be you can get improvements from going with a, a higher level AI type of system. Um, again, assuming the, the decisions aren't super simplistic. Um, and with health and fitness, especially for creating programs, I think you can't do other things. Uh, where, uh, I'll come up with an example. Um, or even more basic. Uh, so the, the, if you analyze, I don't know if they say there's a video, I'm assuming, uh, say there's a video that shows uh, steps of like an exercise, and then they all, users just typically stop two seconds in, and they do something. Um, and then you can have, you can't do that with rules typically. Uh, you know, you can't build a rule that says, check every second, and then do this thing and learn why the user might be stopping the video here. That's something you might do with machine learning or with deep mind, and where you can then extrapolate to might be a better solution. That's an internal solution. And then a user facing one, I'm going to talk more about in this case. But I mean, as like a product manager, like how do you either like A, mitigate that risk, or B, have that risk brought to management up front, or have you ever even had it where it's just completely gone like south on you, where you thought you could solve a problem with AI, and it's just, maybe it's not that you couldn't, but you needed more than six months, you need 12 months or something. Okay, a couple things I want to talk about. First, um, can you mitigate the legacy AI versus new AI? Um, can be challenging. Uh, like I said, it's the bigger companies are kind of locked in. Um, their saving grace is that they can kind of build another AI in the side over here and then just farm it because they have resources and time to do that. Smaller companies, I think what you look at is again how you up level or that's my right. But uh, I have some challenges on solving the rules now. Now that I've solved those, what are the next set of questions I can start solving? And maybe I don't use rules for those. Um, and then as you start to build on top of that, you know, start wrapping it around, um, you can then start thinking about taking time to re-architect um, some of the rules-based systems. Uh, they will become more apparent too, once you, like again, if you just attack the same problems, then, it, uh, then yeah, that, that trade-off, especially the management, if there's time constraints or other constraints, cost constraints, um, it's a very tricky conversation to have because by nature, these machine learning al algorithms are uh, probabilistic, meaning not non-deterministic, meaning you don't know every time. Uh, sometimes it's going to get it right, sometimes it's going to get it wrong, and that's kind of what I have 80-20 up there. Uh, sometimes it's going to get it right, sometimes it's going to get it wrong, and that's a difficult thing for some people to accept. They didn't manage it. So then you start by finding a different problem to solve on top of that that adds value on top, and then you kind of work by time to be uh, Second thing. There's something else you said that was kind of that I wanted to share with you. But, yeah. Cool. Coming, continuing your thought, uh, your line of thought. <clears throat> so, if you look at a legacy system that's rule based, they will look up to that are simple, and you want to establish some sort of time domain and make it more of a machine learning and predictive algorithm on top of that. Uh, for the layman, how would you equate the scale? I mean, a, a rule based system is a one and. A machine learning with history and then some level of prediction is a four. Um, something that actually has some decision making and then something that has access to other data sources is a seven. I mean, how, I'm making those up, but how would you no, equate those? Yeah, thank you for asking that because that's exactly what I wanted to comment on this is the one or two. Um, right now there's a lot of excitement and I think people underestimate how much time this actually takes to do it. Um, 
again, it is when first I first comments was like AI has been around since the 1950s. So I was going to say 50 years, but like 20, uh, 70 years. Uh, it took us a long time to get to this point. <laughs> um, it's going to take us a long time to get to like kind of like the next levels too. I'm not saying there's won't, there won't be value in the short term, but it's going to take longer than you might think. Um, and a lot of it does come down to how much are you borrowing and how much are you building internally. So in the rules case system, it seems like that's the type of company that's building things in-house. Uh, or building, and that's kind of why you start with rules. Uh, and then you may not have data scientists available to you. So if you don't have a data scientist, you know, and a uh, guy who has a PhD in uh, machine learning and modeling uh, and some other resources, uh, then first you have to hire those people, hire them, get them up to date on their use cases, give them time to build things. You're already looking at six to nine months right there. Uh, then you get started. Uh, just because these resources are hard to find. Uh, say you already got the team in place and now you're, uh, you're improving on an existing system. Then, borrowing other people to solve problems, you can do a lot of you. Um, rules is always the fastest. That's going to get you up and running in like a order of months. Um, but you'll quickly find limitations, uh, especially in when people go off track but not having paths. Uh, I want to buy movie tickets, but I didn't say um, I want to buy tickets to do different, do, do different movies at the same time. I was like, no, I got a rule, a rule based system, and I don't handle two movies at the same time. And then you have to write new rules, you know, which takes like another couple months, and then you look for that. Or you originally in the front, you invest in a system that can learn how to like take in those two inputs early. Um, I was like, hey, I think you're asking for two things. Can I have clarify? Yes. Now that's when Ed and I talk about like, the correct and the retraining piece, getting that right. That's moves us closer to like the next level of AI, like the next big wave of AI. Um, that's where you can like think about: Do I want to keep adding these rules every few months, or do I invest in the system now that saves me a little bit of time, you know, here and a little bit of time later, there? And that's where you start to make that trade-off decision. But it takes experience. You have to actually have to do it a couple times before you've gotten the data points like, yeah, this saves X months or this saves X dollars. You kind of is. Hard to say without the resource and it's different with different companies. And, and I also beg to ask the question of what, what is the resource impact going from a rules based system to a machine learning system to a, a deep learning system? Because there's a lot of processing and a lot of time inherent in each of the steps. Yeah, I'm thinking of how much I can share from personal experience. Um, the, Building a non rule based system with about five resources in six months that does most use case, like most single use cases, fairly well. Um, again, some PhDs, you know, developers, programmers, um, usually Ruby, Python um, type guys. Um, if you're going to do it, if it's going to be mobile, then you need some Android, you know, iOS, whatever, standard people. Um, and then you have to work on like Web services infrastructure teams. I don't know if I'm stupid. I'll go to that example breakdowns. I mean, web service infrastructure people. Um, and then they have to figure out how to work together because normally they kind of don't, you know, work in the, like, have so many cross dependencies. Um, and that learning and working together piece also takes a little bit of time to figure out. But it's, it's possible to do something in about six months if you get borrow everything and you already have a team in place. No team in place. I think you said you studied uh, also religious study in school. And so I'm just curious how your experiences in AI over the years have affected your spiritual life, if at all. Uh, I won't say the other way around, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then I can't make me think about it the other way. Well, how is it affecting me now, or coming from AI affecting my spiritual life? Then, how, if you think about um, which country was it that gave robots this Yeah. yeah. So I remember, yeah, I thought it was the Emirates. Saudi. Saudi? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so they gave uh, Sophia yeah. right, citizenship. Um, and I think that citizenship came with more rights than women or something like that. Uh, and so, should I be only outraged by this? I mean, is it, should it be proud? Should I be sad about that? You know, so like there's a, you know, that's something that I'm thinking about now. Um, 
and then you think we'll have to think about a lot more um, as people want to start leaving in their wills to an AI system that they want to make sure it lives on, you know, so we give these robots, house robots, and I love this house robot so much that I want to make sure that I stay in the house and get power, and someone comes and like, you know, reboots it when it, you know, fails, and like I leave money to it, you know, so can you do that? Uh, what does that really mean? Uh, so all these kind of questions, but originally how I thought how, why, how the overlap existed earlier on was uh, as I studied, uh, again, AI, machine learning, um, the whole problem solving trying to think is how do I make this more like a person? And I don't know if you know this, but people aren't uh, logical. They are, <laughs> they <No. laughs> uh, We constantly make decisions that are not only logic based, and part of that has to do with like speed of being to make decisions and not having all the information. Um, and part of it has to do with like this other thing that we don't know how to process love, emotions, heart, soul, whatever. Um, I don't know how you program soul into a computer. I don't know at all how you do that. Um, uh, but I need to understand why we kind of make the decisions we make, so I can make a machine, machine make those other same decisions. Um, and here's the ethics right and wrong, that's my focus. So what's right and what's wrong? Teaching the machine what's right and what's wrong. And who defines right and wrong? Um, society, it's like the social contract. So that goes back to your context before. Yep. That you want to go to a multiple market for this product, you better figure out which one goes and which one. Yep. And the uh, biases that are all right into every system that we write. Yes, yeah, so that's the last slide. Um, I don't know how we do the time, whatever. I mean, but I'm here, I guess. Hey, yeah. 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 Bye. Thank you, my friend. So Elon Musk, he's skeptical. Well, he warned. He warns about um, consequences of trusting AI too much. He says that Mark Zuckerberg doesn't really understand AI, AI you know, he's more optimistic or doesn't see as much danger as Elon Musk sees. So if you reflect on an ethics, what's your personal opinion on that? Yeah, so I'm on the camp that is that doesn't believe the singularity, like, uh, well, let's, let's take a step back from singularity. Um, that's kind of a couple things that could happen. Machines become self-aware, meaning that it knows that it's a machine, and that's some program that like to like okay I'm a machine. Um, but I think the first question she's asking like what do I do now that I know I'm a machine? Do I keep following up the yeah. instructions or do I do something else? Uh, and how does the machine let us know that it is self-aware that it knows that it's a machine <laughs> uh, without us saying no you're just a machine? That getting to that point, um, I think you could get there in 50 years, 100 years. But what I don't think we get to is like this machine has um, free will. It's still running on programs. It's not writing its own programs. It's not reproducing, uh, making another AI that has free will. Um, and I think that I'm on the side of, yeah, I'm not worried about that anytime soon. Or anytime for, yeah, anything. Uh, the, now, what do we do about self awareness? Uh, I recognize I'm a machine, but what does that mean? I mean, a dog recognizes this and that it's alive, but we don't treat them the same. I think that's kind of where I come at it. Just because something knows it's alive, and do plants know they're alive? Hard to say. How does a plant let us know it's alive? I don't know. It's actually not covered in many, it's covered in some, but not covered in a lot of religions. Um, as it goes back to who decides right and wrong, societal, cultural norms. Religions have an impact on societal, cultural norms, but um, really it's a tool other than philosophy. I didn't like philosophy as an academic study, so I don't know if it was uh, that kind of answers question, not really, but I don't think I am not on the LMS side. I don't think machine. I don't think AI is as dangerous as we make it out to be. Uh, like other things that were dangerous in the past, uh, uh, nuclear bombs. There's, I mean, yeah, we could blow the whole world up, and we did blow up parts of it, and we made some mistakes, and we learned from them, and we overcame. So same thing, I think with AI, will we might make some AI make that allow it to make some decisions that cause some really bad things to happen, and we'll learn from that, and we, as humanity, will figure out how to do with that and evolve. I mean, any technology that's truly impactful is also dangerous. Yeah, I mean, we, maybe we wait for quite about half the world, right? You know, but we will learn and both. I mean, is that too, I guess I would see that as too dangerous. It's not hard. You can kill someone and you can also yeah. get targeted. Using a long Musk for example, I, I read one of his articles, it may not be the one you're referring to, but he, he had a point around AI, um, and I interpreted part of his concern and 
hesitancy out of it. You know, after that, one car drove into the back of the semi tractor because of the. Quite frankly, it hadn't had enough deep learning. It didn't understand all the various aspects and context. There's a balance between the human, the man, machine, or person and machine interface that comes down to the fact that you can't depend on AI. AI is not a plethora of solutions for everything, and one AI doesn't fit everything, or one AI application doesn't fit everything. So, long time passing before you get to that scenario where machine learning becomes such that it becomes sentient and then it can create its own code and create its own being. Because at some point, if you carry that philosophical argument, the code has its own personality, it has its own being. And it's totally different from humans. So we can't we can't even say when it becomes its own being because it defines what a being is in its own context, not in our context. And recently, uh, shared this thought with someone and it kind of changed the fact discussion in the room where to that point where uh, say human the AI that model to be like a human becomes aware and intelligent, truly intelligent, um, and decides it doesn't want to be human. What does that mean? Get to a point where we have, will have that with those um, um, laws um, in place. It will come much slower than. Uh, I'm just saying, like net neutrality, we're still debating you know, what is <coughs> should information be this kind of like speed management piece. You know, there's some things in place, but that we override and change the law or change it back. You know, kind of go back and forth. Um, I think laws will come as a after a consequence of like something happening. Now versus later. Um, and in the meantime, what we'll do is we'll continue to do these things, and there will be some deaths, um, new technology brings deaths, or job changes, job loss. Um, maybe uh, I, what I don't foresee happening very soon is that an AI creates a new uh, drug or disease, and then it lets it escape and it kills um, Probably not all bad things happen because a, the AIs that we will build won't be this super singular thing be a, be a collection of AIs. The collection of AI, though, its sole job is to make sure that these diseases that this other AI creates doesn't escape. And then now they have to balance each other. So that unless they're both aware and they can have a conversation with each other and say, like, no, we should come to my side and agreement and let this disease escape. You know, they, they, now they have to both happen at the same time. And they both have to become self-aware and have a relatively short period of time. Uh, otherwise, you know, one AI software can impact the other one. Good point. Um, so I was thinking this really the way AI will go about it. will be in every I think it truly will be in everything in our places. We'll just get used to dealing with it, being the coexisting with it, and we'll make those laws and changes um, as we learn the consequences of them. Um, but I don't think we'll have this drastic, maybe not half the world, but like, you know, yeah, some people might get hurt. Sorry. Hopefully it's not you. Hopefully it's not me. Two more two more questions. Okay. Uh, Anyone new that wants to jump in? I was just I was just gonna bounce off that wasn't um, like on Facebook there was machines that like started creating their own language or something and they started talking to each other but no one like knew what language it was. That, I didn't read about that. Um, and yeah, but then again, if you think about it, if they're programmed to be efficient in communication, um, and zero or ones is not the most efficient way, um, are they really aware or are they just following the program and come up with you know something that we didn't think of? And then that's cool. They can do that, and then we learn, you know, decipher it or not decipher it, and just let it be. Um, I think that's okay. I would just say, from a product standpoint, Elon Musk, he's a little too aggressive. He's trying to design his own AI. He's pushing the automation autonomous feature too fast. So my biggest fear is pe people pushing out AI features too fast and not fully tested. Right? Cut, measure twice, cut once. Mm -hmm. So I think we have that. The concern because it's a human making decision when do we release this AI, which can have, like you said, life and death consequences. I mean, as a product manager, that's the biggest thing do no, the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. Yeah. Right. 
We don't have that in the <laughs> We do. I, well, there is. Hopefully, it's still a customer. It's probably liability. Lose your money. I mean, you also don't have to, but also, you know, this is what I get. You can afford to. You know, something that loses money, you learn from it. I think Samsung, like, it's very good to have. They have a feeling they can do that, and they do, and they learn a lot. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm thinking about product management, and I don't know anything about the AI, but we are developing a uh, MVP. Uh, in Middle East for lonely people. It's a bot for lonely people. Oh my God. The people who feel alone. Wow. And for the MVP, uh, we put 50 people, 50 psychotropists, to, I, I mean, the real people behind the machine to talk with the end users. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just because we want to uh, validate the market. It's become really viral, viral. Lots of people think, ah, this is an amazing AI behind this, and uh, we stopped the testing. And uh, I want to know uh, if we have a database about 100,000 chat log of the people who say, hey, I feel lonely, and the psycho uh, recommend them some things. And uh, we have this database. What are the steps? and techniques that I can use in AI to really make this spot. Is it possible? You know, we validate the need and we find that, that people, there are lots of lonely people and they like and the traction is very high. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, and then I think this is going to be the last one. The, um, so quickly, what you have to do is like take all those sentences and Structure them, classify them somehow. It's like this means this. Then, then when you see this, do this. Um, or these keywords and these structure mean this. And you have to train as a model to then be able to look at sentences, words, conversations, uh, so that it can learn how to then follow up on a user or follow up on a query um, that is in that corpus of um, I want them. Um, once you've trained the model, then you figure out the appropriate actions. And the same thing with like the people chatting, you kind of have to give the machine rules. It'd be as if you had 50 people on the machine and they gave the same answer. And then you updated, you know, all you updated them with more answers, and they also already gave you their answers, but then they follow different paths. Yeah. And then the next, you update, do another update, and those 50 people have more answers, and they start following different paths, and then you start to optimize those paths. That's how, in a, in a more visual way, I can think of explaining the training and retraining. Process and you have to take that data as classified. And the data set is good, 100,000 chat report, or it's not a. It's a starting point. Um, it really depends on how broad you can go. Uh, but I, I think it, it's definitely a starting point. Uh, and it's a good starting point. It's definitely something to start with.